Okay, um, thanks to all of you who are joining us um, online on Zoom. And it's great also to see, let's say about 30 people in the room in person today on, on a beautiful spring day. Thanks to everybody to come out to hear uh, David Law um, share some of his thoughts with, with us today. Um, it's particularly good to have him join us because he's a new member of the UVA faculty, um, started last fall, but is unknown probably to many people on the college side of the grounds uh, because he teaches over at the law school. And um, we didn't have a chance to meet him during a application process. So I think, I hope he's setting an example for something we will do more in the future is that when we hire a new Asianist who joins our faculty, they may have given a talk to the department, but maybe during their first year, we should try to host them so that they could share with their research um, with the broader Asian studies community and we can all work together more effectively. So David is setting a nice example for that. And let me briefly introduce him uh, for those of you who don't know him. Um, he comes to us with at least three degrees, um, not, not counting his BA. So he's got a PhD from Stanford in political science where he was a classmate of politics department chair, uh, Jen Lawless. So we got from Stanford PhD program, both law and Lawless. <laughs> and uh, then he went to, I'm not sure if I'm getting the order correctly, he went to get a comparative law degree at Oxford, um, a JD from Harvard, I think that was first, and then uh, he has worked at a series of institutions, including WashU, UC Irvine, and University of Hong Kong, uh, before joining us here at UVA. So he, his time in Hong Kong overlapped with the experience of the crackdown there. And so I know he has lots to say on that topic, but um, as you know, today he's going to talk to us about uh, Taiwan, constitutional law and judicial review in Taiwan. So those two are just two of many places uh, whose law uh, David studies. Um, he has written a book on, published in Japanese on Japanese uh, constitutional law. And uh, I'm very excited to have uh, some, a colleague who has those kinds of interests joining us. And when I looked over his, his uh, CV, the countries that popped out to me as, as more exotic than Japan, Taiwan, and Hong Kong were Bhutan and Iran and many other countries. So he is really a, a polygot who knows about constitutional law in many different settings, not just the democracies that are studied most often, but also authoritarian systems and how constitutions work in those kind of contexts. And helping us, Taiwan happens to be a particularly interesting case because it has a court that transitioned from an authoritarian system to a democracy, all with the same court. And I look forward to learning much more how that worked. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I take it the mask can come off behind the podium. Is that right? This may help the at-home audience. Uh, I want to thank again everyone for coming in person on this lovely day. It has been wonderful to have the help of the law school, a co-sponsor of this event, but also the initiative of the UVA East Asia Center under Dorothy Wong's exceptional leadership, uh, her initiative putting together this program, and also a program coming up in March with journalists from Hong Kong reporting from the front lines on recent developments there, including one who worked for Apple Daily, which was recently shut down. There were going to be lawyers in that program. They have withdrawn due to national security law concerns, but we were more in terms of, uh, you know, really getting down and dirty in the details there uh, with things that we might not be able to say if there were lawyers present, <laughs> myself accepted. Uh, I also want to thank the UVA Politics Department, Professor so Skopa Sensei, for uh, being my kind chair today, and to thank the uh, a very nice uh, online turnout. So all of you in the virtual world, uh, thank you for tolerating yet another Zoom. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I hope that um, I hope that everything is visible and audible. I make no promises as to quality. Now, uh, um, so today's talk is about judicial review of constitutional amendments in Taiwan. But I want to say a bit first about the book to put that substance in context. And those of you who are at home and feeling a bit bored, as you're looking at the cover, which you can also find online, uh, this is a visual scavenger hunt. So if you're looking for extra credit activities, uh, if it brings the bell, it should. This is based off Howard Chandler Christie's scene at the signing of the US Constitution, which hangs in the US Capitol in 1940. In this version, all figures but one have been replaced by a very capable artist based in Islamabad uh, by figures representing each of the 20 jurisdictions 
covered in this book. Some, but not all, are historical figures. So uh, think of it as an Easter egg hunt for comparative constitutional law at enthusiasts and Asianists. Those of you playing along at home can see how many of them we have made. And uh, I think I might be willing to take some guesses uh, in, the, uh, in the Zoom Q&A time for me. Now, some meta questions. Why bother with Taiwan? Why bother with this book? Uh, I don't assume that everyone is here through the East Asia Center. Um, I assume that some people may be asking themselves, Taiwan is small and it is far away. Uh, it rarely figures in comparative literature and no wonder. Uh, now it's not so obscure anymore due to the talk of war, but still from a constitutional law perspective, why bother? And more generally, uh, this book, why bother with this book? Why would anyone want a book that talks about small, far away and or obscure places like Taiwan or Nepal or Sudan or wait for it, Cyprus? Right? or about the liberal non-democratic countries like China and Iran and Singapore. This book is the equivalent of a bunch of obscure B-sides. And for that, there are way cooler places to absorb obscurity than a talk in the Royal Hall on a Friday afternoon. Um, so let me try to put this in context. Uh, comparative constitutional law or comparative constitutional studies, if you prefer, it is an exciting moving field. Uh, I think I was very lucky to accidentally get in on the ground floor of this when I was in graduate school in the late 90s. The world is our oyster. And we get important and interesting questions at the intersection of law and politics and history and anthropology and sociology. And we come at them from a variety of disciplinary and national perspectives. There is lots of low hanging fruit. And having said that, it has its blind spots. And I'm gonna say a bit about the blind spots of the field as currently constituted and why this book looks the way that it does and why I would talk about Taiwan today. Now, the usual way of approaching, uh, introducing the study of constitutionalism is to survey the existing literature on constitutionalism. If you pick up a research handbook, if you pick up a textbook, this is what you're likely to get. And it's easy to see why. Um, and the result is a focus on canonical topics and jurisdictions. Uh, and along with that, an, ine an inescapable replication of the existing blind spots of the field. Okay. And uh, so what's needed to implement this approach is a rear view mirror. You need to know where the field is already being. And usually, in practice, this means a focus on a combination of the usual suspects that are called literature, a dozen or so liberal democracies with judicial review, Canada, South Africa, Israel, Germany, a bunch of Western Europe. Uh, not much on Asia, not much on the global South, not much on the Muslim world, right? Um, standard topics, a heavy emphasis on the protection of negative rights, civil and political liberties, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, privacy, so on and so forth, and, and a bit on allocation of powers, both vertical federalism and horizontal separation of powers. In terms of the texts that are used, a uh, usual approach, a heavy emphasis on judicial opinions, and that would also explain why there's this emphasis on countries with judicial review. They're the ones that like, you know, milking a cow, those are the countries with the courts you could milk for judicial opinions that lend themselves to scholarly exegesis. And occasionally you'll read the text of a constitutional provision. And this also comes with sort of standard limits on the scope of the field that are a function of the way that the key terms are defined. Uh, constitutionalism in particular is used in a very traditional 18th century sense uh, to refer to liberal democracies that respect liberal constitutional rights and have the goal of restraining state power. And on this definition, uh, certain countries are excluded by definition from the scope of the field. So you won't hear so much about uh, the liberal states or dictatorships, a large swath of the world aren't appropriate objects of study under the traditional approach. The other approach, which is what uh, uh, my contributors and I have tried to implement, my long suffering, very patient contributors and I have tried to implement this book is what we might call the smorgasbord approach. And the approach here is not to survey this existing literature, but rather to convey the diversity of how constitutionalism is it is actually practiced around the world, wherever and in whatever form we may find it. Whether or not it consists of the study of judicial opinions, whether or not we find it in liberal democratic form, whatever is there, we study it. Like a doctor who doesn't just focus on healthy patients, we're gonna also focus on sick patients. We're not just gonna focus on tall, or rich people. We're gonna focus on shorter, less wealthy people, right? In order to understand constitutionalism in all of its diversity, we need to sample constitutionalism in all of its diversity. So the goal of this approach is a diverse sampling of emerging topics and underexplored jurisdictions from around the world. 
that means in turn commissioning original work because by definition, if these topics are only emerging or the jurisdictions are underexplored, you can't turn to 16 or 20 articles and books that are already on the field on it. Why do we need this approach? I argue that this is valuable both for scholars and for students as a complement the existing traditional approach. First, scholars need the blind spots for it. Right? Again, we're like doctors that only study healthy patients. We study liberal democracies, judicial review. We don't study the liberal authoritarian regimes. And second, and here's what I'm going to try to prove today, if I can, students can learn as much, at least as much, about constitutionalism from case studies of emerging topics and underexplored jurisdictions as they can from studying the canon of Canadian and German and South African and Israeli constitutional decisions. To show you what I mean by a collection of obscure B-sides, the book has two tables of contents because each chapter is modular. It combines a topic with a jurisdiction. And so there are two tables of contents. The first table of contents corresponds to the topics. Some of the choicer topics you won't necessarily find in most books, constitutional history and constitutional migration using Nepal as the case study. A chapter on international law and constitution making using Sudan as the case study, a chapter on Islamic constitutionalism using Iran. And today's focus, this chapter on judicial review of constitutional limits in Taiwan, and as promised, the, uh, the smallest country in the batch, not counting Hong Kong, which is not a country, of course, of citizenship and nationality in the context of Cyprus. In terms of jurisdictions, again, countries, regions you don't normally see in the literature, China, Taiwan, Nepal, Indonesia, kind of unforgivable that Indonesia doesn't appear more in literature. This is a very populous, very important country, uh, and yet you rarely see it. The same could be said of Thailand. Lots of action there that you wouldn't know from English language literature. New Zealand, Afghanistan, Iran, Cyprus, uh, Argentina, Brazil, huge important country, and yet surprisingly little in the English language literature on Brazil and in Sudan. All right, so let's turn to Taiwan. Uh, I think those of you who are here through the East Asia Center, uh, this probably doesn't need much introduction, but Taiwan is this little island sitting off the coast of China, um, and uh, it's south of Japan, uh, and it's like 20 nautical miles, and like 90 nautical miles between uh, China and uh, Taiwan. Um, so this turns out to be an outstanding case study because this is a constitutional court in Taiwan that in a very short span of time ran the full gamut from being a rubber stamp for authoritarian rule to exercising powers of a type that we basically almost never see constitutional courts exercising. And it did so, as far as we can tell, very successfully and helped to consolidate Taiwan's transition to democracy. So how do you go from the proverbial 98 pound weakling of the judicial world to the incredible Hulk smashing through everything in its path and forcing institutions to kill themselves by a constitutional amendment, which the Taiwanese constitutional court did. How did this happen? Well, as always with any uh, scholarly lesson, we need to start with some basic vocabulary. And I, those of you who are in the constitutional law field, forgive me for going over the obvious points. Um, you're probably all familiar with the idea of judicial review, sometimes known in British circles or Commonwealth circles as constitutional review. And this is when courts invalidate sometimes executive action, but more often legislation as being incompatible with the Constitution. We're very familiar with that here in the United States. The US Supreme Court has a long history of striking down both state and federal statutes. And that's what we call hard judicial review, where the court strikes down the law, says it's unconstitutional, and the legislature does not have the option of formally overriding that decision. Now, it can't amend the Constitution as a runaround, but we'll get to that in a minute. We usually say that the legislature is stuck with whatever the court has said in a hard review setting. Then there's soft review, which we see in a lot of Commonwealth countries, countries that traditionally had uh, parliamentary supremacy. Canada, our neighbor to the north, and my home in land is an example of this, where uh, with respect to most of the rights in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the Canadian Supreme Court can declare a law unconstitutional, incompatible with the Charter, but the legislature has the power under Section 33 of the Charter, the so-called notwithstanding clause, to reenact the law notwithstanding the Canadian Supreme Court's decision. And this notwithstanding reenactment of the law is indefinitely renewable. So that's called soft review. We see versions of that in New Zealand, the United Kingdom, Canada, uh, and a couple of other places because although the court has the power to strike down statutes, the legislature has the power to respond by in some way overcoming or declining the court's decision, and it's formally allowed to do so. There's nothing extra constitutional or wrong about the legislature doing this. 
And one of the justifications for this is this is the best of both worlds. This is like a dialogue between the uh, courts and the legislature, rather than the court saying, we're right, you're wrong, be quiet, be with, right? It's, well, here are the reasons we have concerns about the statute. You have the democratic legitimacy and power to reenact the statute, but we hope you'll seriously consider our well-reasoned constitutional objections. Legislature, thank you so much, Canadian Supreme Court. Those are very thoughtful reasons, and now we will carefully and deliberately weigh whether we should reenact the law given your enlightenment of our needs. We really appreciate that so much, and very Canadian, and a lot of thanking you. <laughs> um, and so that's how soft review is supposed to work, and that's supposed to be a really nice middle ground between uh, judicial supremacy, we're the US Supreme Court, we win, ha, 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 and legislative supremacy, we're Congress, we win, you don't get anything, ha, ha, ha. It's supposed to be this happy middle ground, this exchange of views, and from this exchange of views, this dialogue, we get better results more responsive to democratic concerns, while also more responsive to constitutional concerns. This is the best of all possible worlds, or so we're told. Okay, so that's the case for soft review, and you can see immediately why this would be so attractive to constitutional law scholars around the world. Scholars are really drawn to the idea of, of progress through reason and debate, and that's what the soft review seems to promise, right? That seems to offer, you know, the, the the best of the world in, 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 in the best solution to the Goldilocks problem. This judicial review has too much legislative supremacy. This judicial review has too much judicial supremacy. Ah, soft review is just right. I got that mattress dialed to five. I love it there. Um, there's also this great literature on review of constitutional amendments. This is going to be a lot harder for some Americans to wrap their head around, but the idea here is that a court can strike down a constitutional amendment. And the question is why? Uh, easier to accept would be the constitutional amendment is defective procedurally in some way. So for example, it, there have to be two readings in the legislature and there's only one reading and the court goes, yeah, come on, that's, that's procedurally improper. That's not so controversial, right? There's an obvious procedural problem with the adoption of the amendment. Uh, things get trickier when the reason for invalidating the amendment is substantive. So for example, if it's Germany and there's some constitutional amendment that appears to threaten the idea of multi-party democracy, there, is, uh, there are textual provisions in the German constitution and others that purport to forbid certain kinds of amendments. We have those as well in the United States. Uh, you can't just amend the constitution through ordinary means to eliminate the equal suffrage for the states and the Senate, right? That's a combination of procedural and a restrictive uh, and a substantive restriction on constitutional amendment in the US. So one reason might be the Constitution says that you can't adopt this kind of amendment. You can't do away with the basic democratic order. You can't do away with equal suffrage in the Senate. Another, with the courts getting more aggressive, is the courts will say, OK, look, you call this an amendment. But really, what you call an amendment is a fundamental transformation of the basic structure of the constitutional order. You're really replacing the Constitution to try to call it amendment. You've gone beyond the scope of what can be done via the mechanism of constitutional amendment. And so you can't do that. We're going to say that amendments can't affect the basic structure of the constitution. And we're going to be the judges of whether an amendment to the constitution affects this basic structure. And if it does, we're gonna reject it as beyond your power to amend. So you can also think of this as in effect, a judicially fashioned and judicially enforced distinction between constitutional amendment, small fry, and constitutional replacement. Big fry can't necessarily be done using the usual channels. So we end up with uh, two uh, hot topics in the comparative study of judicial review, okay? Building on this vocabulary, first is uh, hard versus soft judicial review. Which is better? Which do we like? Dialogic review, isn't it cool? Should we pursue it? Should we pursue dialogic review or should we pursue it even more enthusiastically, right? The answer is yes or a more enthusiastic yes in the literature. Uh, does soft review strike a happy medium between legislative and executive supremacy? Uh, does soft review promote interinstitutional dialogue and thus enhance deliberative democracy and our capacity to all hold hands and sing kumbaya together in unison? Uh, the other hot topic here is a judicial review of constitutional amendments. Uh, is it too extreme in terms of judicial supremacy and the counter-majoritarian character of judicial review. A lot of Americans already have qualms about the Supreme Court being able to strike down laws. Like, who elected them? They're just making this stuff up. I don't see that in the Constitution. What right do you have to say that I do or don't have a right to abortion or capital punishment is or isn't constitutional? I don't see any of that stuff there. That's undemocratic. 
And you think that's undemocratic, wait until you get to the point where you're not even allowed to amend the constitution to get your way anymore. The court says, not only are we telling you this unconstitutional, but we're not going to let you amend the constitution to get your way. So there, right? That's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it, which we're increasingly seeing in the comparative constitutional literature is no, no, this is an important line of defense against would-be authoritarians who make a democratic regime authoritarian by creeping their powers forward here, creeping their powers forward there, and doing it all in this formal legal way. I'm gonna amend the constitution by eliminating term limits on myself. I'm gonna amend the constitution by making it easier to amend the constitution in the future. I'm gonna do these things that entrench me and make it difficult for the opposition to take power and allow me lawfully to eliminate the opposition and consolidate my power. And so we need courts to plug this hole in the defenses of constitutional democracies by making sure that leaders who have temporary political majorities can't amend away the checks and balances of a democratic system. So actually, the problem isn't that courts are too powerful, it's that they're not powerful enough. Ask a constitutional lawyer, what's the solution to the world's problems? And somehow the, the answer often is, more lawyers, more courts, and more judges, okay? Now, two problems with the state of the literature. Number one, Conceptually, are these really separate debates, hard versus soft, judicial review of amendments or not? Or are they actually really about the same normative question? A leading way of framing this, you can tell what my answer is. The same underlying question would be to what extent should courts have the last word on constitutional questions? That's a normative question. But before we even get there, I think there's an even more important antecedent question. Should we even be asking the normative question? Is it even possible for courts to have the last word on constitutional questions. What do I mean by that? Well, does this question, should courts have the last word, rest on a flawed empirical premise? Meaning, uh, is it even possible for courts to have this awesome power of the last word where courts can absolutely run roughshod over legislatures and executives and force their will on the rest of the political system. And the only thing keeping us from this rule by judges is the self-restraint and virtue of the judges. Um, and if that's not possible, then why are we fretting? If courts don't even have that ability, then why are we fretting about the potentially tyrannous counter-majoritarian rule of courts? Okay. So, Raises us to question that these are really separate debates. And here's one of the things we try to do in the chapter, uh, which we think is original, is to integrate all of these questions into a single, spe single spectrum. So for example, there's this idea that some countries have no judicial review, like supposedly you know, New Zealand, right? Uh, but no review blends into soft review. Why? Because courts are, even in systems with quote unquote no judicial review, like the Netherlands, courts interpret statutes narrowly to avoid constitutional questions. You can't stop them from interpreting statutes, and you can't stop them from interpreting statutes narrowly to avoid constitutional concerns. That's allowed, even in non-judicial review systems. And what's the difference between that and a system where the legislature can override by rewriting the statute? Answer, there isn't really one. The other extreme of the spectrum, soft review blends into hard review. Let's say you're in Canada, and the Supreme Court strikes down laws. And let's say, as has actually been the case, the Canadian federal government just never uses the override power. Like, oh, we lost. Well, it would be very impolite eh, for us to override the Canadian Supreme Court. So maybe we'll just kind of let that decision ride and uh, we'll just keep doing that for uh, you know, 40 years. Maybe we'll wait another 40 years before, I don't know. It seems kind of rude to say that you're active. <laughs> the result is that soft review basically becomes, I'm channeling my, my inner Canadian. Uh, the, if the legislature keeps rolling over and playing dead or just being Canadian polite, uh, soft review becomes de facto hard review. It never gets reversed. And then you have the worst of both worlds. You have a court that's like, hey, we're not being undemocratic. You can override us anytime. And you have a legislature that's afraid to override it, just won't do it. And hard review can blend into soft review. You have the US Supreme Court saying, we win, this law is unconstitutional. You can't do anything about it unless you amend the constitution. And oh, shoot, you amended the constitution, right? We've seen that happen, for example, in Singapore. Like, yeah, that was a way to end run us. And in that case, Constitutional amendment is just a form of legislative override. It may not even be subject to heightened procedural requirements. Not every country makes it harder to amend the Constitution, or that much harder to amend the Constitution, than to amend regular legislation. And even super hard review can be kind of soft. You can then try to respond by saying, hey, court, 
you shall, we're, not only can you, you have to accept this constitutional amendment, we're going to take away your power to strike down constitutional amendments. They tried this in India, and the Indian Supreme Court was like, no, actually, you can't amend away our power to strike down constitutional amendments. So your effort to amend away our power to strike down your amendments, we're rejecting that amendment too, right? And so it's just this kind of uh, endless uh, one-upmanship, right? So legislatures can, amiss, can resist amendment review by repeatedly amending the constitution, and courts can resist this by repeatedly rejecting constitutional amendments. In other words, there's no end. So what we actually get when we put all this together isn't uh, two separate debates, but rather a spectrum of judicial review, where it goes from no review to soft review to hard review to procedurally based amendment review to substantive text-based amendment review to substantive doctrinal amendment review, all the way to, wait for it, Taiwan amendment initiation by the court, where the court isn't just striking down constitutional amendments and saying, you government need to amend the constitution and you need to amend it the following way. If you could do that by next month, that would be really great. Thank you so much. Uh, and every point on the spectrum is in some sense dialogic, meaning that other institutions always have an opportunity to respond in one way, in some way. So there's always this opportunity for escalation or responsive dialogic responsiveness. Uh, even courts that strike down constitutional amendments have harder and softer more and less dialogic ways of doing so. And the spectrum can and does extend over time because every time an institution find new ways to push, other institutions find new ways to push back. And so the escalation continues. Okay, so how have we seen this take place in Taiwan? Um, what, what, how are we doing with the time? Whoa, okay. So I don't know how much people here know about uh, Taiwanese history. But the basic idea is this. The government currently that governs Taiwan is technically called the Republic of China government, the ROC. The ROC used to control for a brief period of time after World War II, the whole kit and caboodle, all of mainland China and Taiwan. And very shortly after World War II and after the Japanese were booted, a civil war broke out between the Republic of China government led by the KMT, the Kuomintang, and the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, any points for who won that particular civil war? <laughs> um, so the, Taiwan, the Republic of China government, the KMT, retreated to Taiwan, which it had always controlled, and they were kicked out of the mainland by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, now notice in this story a couple of things. First, the Chinese Communist Party never actually controlled Taiwan for even a single moment of a single day. What Taiwan is controlled by is it's just it just governs what's left of the Republic of China, right? So Taiwan isn't a breakaway province. That would be a bit like the United States referring to the United Kingdom as a breakaway province. Logically speaking, it's the other way around, that the United States broke away from the United Kingdom, mainland China broke away from the government of Taiwan. If you want to be logical about it, not that logic matters. Um, the second thing to take away about this is that Taiwan, this little island, was left with this unbelievably complicated Rube Goldberg contraption of a constitution that you take a Western constitution, you add federalism to it, and then Sun Yat-sen comes along and goes, no, this needs to be more Chinese, more unique. This needs more cowbell. Let's add some more branches of government. To it. Let's add a, a control branch, and, uh, an examination branch. A uh, question, Dr. Sun, uh, are future generations of judges going to know what these are? No, but it's unique. So let's put in there more branches equals more fun and more good stuff. And let's also make it a federal system so the provinces have power, but uh, wait, wait a minute, Taiwan is by itself a small province, so you're going to have a federal system on top of a national system, and the province coincides with the borders of the entire country, and how is that going to work? Cha, don't worry about that. Uh, and then finally, um, you have this problem where the legislatures, and Taiwan has two legislatures, because again, you wouldn't want things to be simple. It's Sun Yat-sen and it's Chinese constitutional theories. It's got to be super complicated. So you've got two legislatures, the National Assembly, which is a constituent assembly and can amend the constitution, and the legislative yuan, which is what we would kind of consider a legislature, it makes laws. And both of them consist of representatives elected from all of China. And when the KMT government flees to Taiwan, these officials, these officials elected to represent places like Shanghai and Beijing, right? They remain in office temporarily until their replacements can be elected 
and the temporary emergency is over. And at one point, in Purport number 31, 1954, the Taiwanese Constitutional Court blesses the KMTs continuing to allow these people to serve. The KMT loves this because these people are all KMT loyalists. So they're reliable supporters for whatever the KMT wants to do. And they can stay until such time as the emergency is over temporarily and they can be replaced, meaning they can never be replaced because Taiwan, the Republic of China, is not going to retake mainland China. That is preposterous. And it always has been preposterous. But that is the legal fiction on which Taiwan was governed by a legislature full of people who were elected once and only once 40 plus years ago. And they are mindless supporters of a particular party. By the time democratization occurs in 19, starts to occur in 1987, these people are literally drooling invalids. They're automatic votes for the KMT. And they've been temporarily <laughs> elected to serve. And you can't get rid of them. These people are become known as the old thieves. And these legislative assemblies became known as the literally 10,000 year Congress, or it was called the never ending Congress. And this is the scenario that the Taiwanese Constitutional Court faces as democratization gets underway. They're stuck with this legislature of these superannuated old thieves. And they're stuck with here's the kicker a constitution that requires that these legislative bodies consist of people elected from all of China. How do you deal with that? What is the Taiwanese Constitutional Court's solution? Well, the Taiwanese Constitutional Court does a couple of things, and if you describe it briefly, it doesn't sound so revolutionary. If you describe it at greater length, it's jaw-dropping. So the first thing it does, one of the major steps it does is uh, interpretation number 261 of 1990. It orders these so-called first-term representatives, the ones who were elected in the 1940s, once. It says, you have to leave by 1991, and it mandates elections in due course. Now, note that you cannot implement that without some change to the constitutional text, you would see, because the constitutional text does not permit you to ignore the fact that all of China is supposed to be represented in the legislative bodies. The second thing that happens is, remember that body I told you called the National Assembly, the one that's populated with the old thieves who were elected in the 1940s? So they're the sole ones with the power to amend the constitution. And you know, they're kind of like, you know, I, I think I understand that we're not elected. We're supposed to legislate ourselves out of business. But I think we need a little more time. I think what we need to do is pass a constitutional amendment to give ourselves a couple more years in office to finish the difficult, arduous task of democratizing Taiwan. So let's pass some constitutional amendments that just happen to extend our 40 plus year term in office. And the constitutional court gets this and goes, oh, come on. So we, our tool is interpretation and enforcement of the constitution. The problem is that you keep rewriting the thing that we enforce. So how can we enforce the constitution to kick you out when your response is to rewrite the constitution? Head scratch, okay? So the answer to that was interpretation 499 of the year 2000 in which the Taiwanese constitutional court strikes down this constitutional amendment in which the National Assembly did some self-dealing. All right, so um, again, the summary, the problem, the initial problem is this democratizing the legislature, right? Uh, the, not only the text of the constitution, but the TCC's own previous precedent says that these holdovers, the old thieves, can stay temporarily until their replacements can be elected, meaning in reality forever. And the problem for the court here is that creating a truly elected legislature requires not only overruling the earlier case, but also amending the constitution. They can't fix this by interpreting the constitution. So what do they do in interpretation 261? They say, you guys have to, this is not okay, right? Uh, given the circumstances, the central government, look at this. This is not interpreting the constitution. This is not striking down anything. It says, the central government shall make an appropriate plan in accordance with the essence of this interpretation to hold the next election, including a certain number of representatives at large so that the constitutional system will continue to function. Translation, you government need to amend the constitution and the way we are telling you to amend the constitution is to introduce more representatives who represent the country at large. So we're telling you amend it 
and amend it this way. And the result is the following year, the First Amendment is adopted doing precisely this. The government adopts the amendment as ordered by the Taiwanese Constitutional Court. And you're thinking to yourself, I don't remember other cases of courts telling governments how to amend the Constitution. You're right. That's not, a, that's not like a thing that happens all the time. The treasure is one finds when one looks at obscure, small, faraway places that don't fall into the ocean. Well, that still leaves the problem of the National Assembly and its ability to self-deal itself some very friendly constitutional amendments. It's still dominated by the old thieves. It passes the Fifth Amendment, extending its own term by two years. And the problem now is how can the Constitutional Court use the Constitution to stop the National Assembly's self-dealing if the National Assembly has the power to rewrite the Constitution to protect itself? Well, then comes Interpretation 499. Now, instead of amendment initiation, we have amendment review. And there's this comparative analysis. The court says, well, you know, in some countries, constitutional courts have reviewed the constitutionality of constitutional amendments on both procedural and substantive grounds. And here's, here's the reason. And for those of you who are used to American judicial opinions, uh, let me tell you, you can come up to speed on Taiwanese constitutional law pretty quickly because these are short decisions. You've got India at one extreme, where a decision can take up 601 case, can take up 600 pages of reporter. And then you've got the US Supreme Court, where it's like, yeah, we're going to go on for 40 or 60 pages because, hey, law clerk time is cheap. And then you've got the Taiwanese Constitutional Court, where the justices sit around at the table going over the opinions word by word on their computer terminals. They also, so that discourages verbosity because you have to agree on every single Chinese character in the decision as a whole in committee. Plus, it's a civil law system, so you're not supposed to be verbose inside a bunch of precedents and yada, yada, yada. Okay, so these are short decisions. So what I'm showing you here is, isn't the head notes from the case reporter, this is the entirety of the action of the court's reasoning right here. To allow an amendment designed to alter existing constitutional provisions concerning the fundamental nature of governing norms and order, and hence the foundation of the Constitution's very existence destroys the integrity and fabric of the Constitution itself. As a result, such amendment must be deemed improper. In other words, what you're doing cuts against the basics, basic structure of the constitutional order. We are judging that this is beyond the power to amend. Since the National Assembly is a constitutionally ordained institution and its power is bestowed by the Constitution, it must also be regulated by the Constitution. Right? And then the court goes on to say a bit more, even if we assume, as the National Assembly argued, that they needed more time, no more time. They were just giving themselves more time to complete the necessary reforms. The goal does not justify the means to recuse them. They sh should have recused themselves in light of a conflict of interest. At a bare minimum, what they needed to do was to say the extension doesn't take effect until after the next election. So there's no self-dealing. Now, is that a sensible decision? Yes. Can you find anything resembling that in the text of the Republic of China Constitution? Er, OK. So let's just put on our lawyer's hat for a moment and evaluate the decision from a legal perspective. How persuasive were interpretations 261 and 499? How well-rounded were they? To what extent could the TCC say, well, you know, it seems like we're being extreme, but the law compels us to do this. OK, so first, was the court's reasoning justification plausible, reasonable? Yeah, sure, that made sense. It was internally coherent. Much of it did resonate with what courts had elsewhere had said and done on other occasions. Indeed, the Taiwanese court cited some foreign decisions in support. Um, but on the other hand, you know, these are very short decisions. Uh, an American reader would look at this and go, wow, this is really short, given what the court was doing. You know, the English translation runs to a little over 8,000 words. To put that in perspective, on 499, and that's like a mammoth decision, the Taiwanese Constitutional Court. To put that in perspective, that just barely satisfies UVA Law School's upper year writing requirement. And this is how Taiwanese Constitutional Court democratized Taiwan, okay? They just barely cleared the bar, like the minimum, less than that, and I don't give you credit for your term paper, law professor, right? Um, the US Supreme Court can barely clear its throat in 8,000 words. But if we want to talk about the reasoning, the logic, yeah, it passes the laugh test. Now, a very different question is, was the TCC's reasoning, legal reasoning, so compelling that no reasonable, fair-minded lawyer could object to it as an overreach, a judicial overreach? No, it wasn't. Could the TCC plausibly claim that these decisions, though momentous, nevertheless follow ineluctably, unavoidably from existing law? Could the TCC plausibly claim, hey, this looks extreme, but our hands are tied? Impossible. Here's why. 
even though the TCC had technically been around for decades, dating back to the creation of the government of China prior to World War II, it was still for practical purposes a new court. In terms of establishing a body of case law that it could draw on, it had not done so because for decades it had simply been a rubber stamp for KMT authoritarian rule. And that's understandable. Uh, it couldn't hope to defy the KMT and still win, but the net result was still, it didn't have any case law to work with. They were just making this up. The net case law, they didn't have any in the text of the constitution. They had no record, no track record for striking down statutes, never mind striking down a constitutional amendment, and then also telling the government what amendments need to be adopted. So this is several bridges too far from the perspective of skeptics, democratic skeptics of judicial review. And yet the Taiwanese Supreme Constitutional Court totally got away with it, didn't just get away with it, it came out smelling like a rose, like a well-respected popular institution. And how did this happen? How did politicians roll over and play dead when told to do things that had basically no foundation in the text of the Constitution, no foundation in the Taiwanese Constitutional Court's case law, none of the type of legal foundation that we are trained as American lawyers to think is so all important? How did it get away with this? A couple of answers here. The prime answer is simply the Taiwanese public was okay with it. This needs to change. Who's going to change it? The old thieves are not changing it. You can talk about the Taiwanese constitutional court being undemocratic, but the problem with that criticism is democratic legitimacy is relative. Okay, I get that the Taiwanese constitutional court isn't elected, but these jokers, technically they were elected 40 years ago. They're not more legitimate. So our choice is democratically illegitimate court or even more democratically illegitimate quote unquote legislature. That's an institutional vacuum. You can't tell the courts to defer to democracy when the institutions of democracy themselves are not developed. So we accept the Taiwanese constitutional court stepping in and doing what needs to be done with the support of the people. And I submit to you that when it comes to defining how much power court really has, forget what's in the text of the constitution about the courts or indeed what the courts are allowed to do, and just ask yourself, what will people put up with from the court? Will they support what the court is doing? So I submit to you that the Taiwanese Constitutional Court is an example of the smorgasbord approach paying off. Go into these obscure corners of the world, see what you can learn from them. And in the case of Taiwan, I think we get three all important lessons uh, from the comparative study of judicial review. I'm gonna call these the elusiveness of finality, the ubiquity of dialogic review, and the contextuality of judicial power. I'm not saying everything you need to know about comparative judicial review you can get from Taiwan, but you can get at least as much from Taiwan as you can from pretty much the study of any other place. What do I mean by the elusiveness of finality? Elusiveness of finality, the ubiquity of dialogical review. First, I mean judicial engagement with other institutions on constitutional matters is inescapable. Other institutions cannot prevent the courts from weighing in on constitutional issues, and conversely, the courts cannot prevent other institutions from weighing in on constitutional issues. The result is that government institutions have to deal with each other on questions of constitutional meaning and enforcement. And that dealing with each other, nobody gets an isolation hermetically sealed to have the final say on what the constitution means and how it will be applied. That's called constitutional politics. You can't have constitutional law without constitutional politics. Once you figure that out, the next step follows. For every move, there's a counter move. There can be no such thing as the last move or the last word in this game, because this is constitutional politics. And constitutional politics, like any other kind of politics, does not have an end point. Politics is an ongoing thing. It doesn't end because a court says that it's final and supreme. No, 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 no. Nor does it end if a legislature declares it is final and supreme. No, 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 no. That game goes on. And in this sense, then, all judicial review is dialogic. To foreclose dialogue, exchange between government institutions, and the sense of acting in such a way as to leave other institutions with no opportunity to respond is impossible. Because again, that would imply that politics has an endpoint, which it doesn't. All of these institutions are inventive, resourceful, and depending on the circumstances, very persistent. And so they keep coming up with new stuff. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. So the question the courts face is more strategic than normative. When should they keep pushing and when should they fold? They're never in any danger of preempting dialogue. 
The question is, do they want to prolong the dialogue? The dialogue will always be there. And finally, oh, perfect, two minutes to go. Um, the contextuality of judicial power. Right? There's a lot of writing in constitutional theory, particularly American constitutional theory, that frets about the excessive power of the courts and how they can offend the public and trigger backlash and how should they restrain themselves. Um, and a lot of this literature is built on, uh, is normative and is built on the assumption that judicial review is counter-majoritarian and that creates a problem for the institution of judicial review. Um, very questionable assumption. And by questionable is my nice way of saying wrong, all right? Um, first, judicial power in practice can be considerably lesser or greater than what we see on paper. Some courts are given the power of judicial review, but don't exercise it. CEG, a lot of Scandinavia, they just don't do it. In theory, they could, but they don't. Other courts are not given it, but they exercise it every day, like they're getting their, you know, their quad work in. That's the US Supreme Court. I know the text of the Constitution doesn't give judicial review power. We gotta invalidate some more statutes, keep that up, right? 10 more reps. Uh, and then, you know, some, uh, some go way beyond what the Constitution prescribes, the Indian Supreme Court, the Colombian Supreme Court, the Taiwanese Constitutional Court, striking down constitutional amendments. So what can you get away with, right? If judicial power isn't tethered to slash defined by the text of the Constitution, what, what quicksand is it built on? And the answer is, it seems to be built like anything else in politics. In this sense, constitutional politics are not different from regular politics. Public support, you have public support, that's critical, if not necessary and sufficient. And any showdown with other institutions, it doesn't matter how nice or fancy your legal reasoning is, if you have the public on your side, you're in good shape regardless of whether you're formally elected or whether you have a legal argument that will appeal to law professors. Bottom line, right? That's hard sometimes for lawyers to swallow, but we as lawyers, those of us who are lawyers, should not drink too much of our Kool-Aid and put too much emphasis on the persuasiveness of our own legal reasoning. Because when it comes to the question of whether a court will prevail, it's not clear that judicial reasoning makes that much of a difference as opposed to whether the public is on board with it. And finally, this goes straight to the idea that courts are undemocratic and need to be careful about the power of judicial review. If you look at public opinion polls across countries, courts consistently have more public support than elected institutions. Even the US Supreme Court itself, studies have concluded the US Supreme Court, on average, follows public opinion more closely than the elected branches the president of Congress, okay? Courts often can and do enjoy more public support and legitimacy than elected institutions. And so we should not marvel at the incredible sight of these institutions that have neither the power of the purse nor the sword, these supposedly infamously weak institutions, if they keep pulling out their dragon slayer sword, pointing at the National Assembly saying, and now amend yourself out of existence. Nice, thank you for hitting yourself to death, right? <laughs> which is literally what the Taiwanese Constitutional Court did. What we can have are high legitimacy courts. The US is a great example. The majority of judges in this country are elected. Who has a superior democratic pedigree to an elected judge? Answer, no one. In theory, if you think elections are that important, I don't even think that important, but if that's what you care about so much, most of our judges are as democratically legitimate as any elected official you'll find. Low legitimacy legislatures are also possible. Consider Taiwan's legislature, or consider the Legislative Council in Hong Kong, which also is not elected. Right? So you can have, it is not an oxymoron to speak of democratically illegitimate legislatures or democratically legitimate courts. And once we have that breakthrough, we realize that we cannot say ex ante from a theoretical perspective that judicial review is undemocratic and therefore its power must be exercised carefully simply not true. And it, why one of the reasons comparative study, even of obscure jurisdictions like Taiwan is important, is so that we don't make these assumptions and take for granted that they are correct across the rest of the world, because they simply are not. And hopefully we have something to learn from that. Thank you for your patience. Again, on a lovely Friday afternoon, I look forward to questions. In my uh, moderator role, um, I'm going to ask just a couple of questions uh, to get us started and make sure we save plenty of time for you to join in. 
Um, I'm not sure, I guess I'm gonna step back there after I ask my questions to uh, monitor the chat and uh, see if we get some questions online. So if you do have questions online, please put those on the chat. So this was a really interesting uh, introduction to a, a topic that I think most people in the audience didn't know a whole lot about. Um, I was most um, interested to see you put judicial review in this whole spectrum, um, where there's this whole range beyond where the United States is. Um, that Taiwan can show us. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, but, and I'm glad you eventually at the end of the talk got to the question of you know, how were they able to do that? Why were they successful? Um, because I think that's the, spec, the question your spectrum will raise to for people who know a lot about a lot of other systems. Um, why hasn't the US been able to move all the way to where Taiwan is? Um, and you talked mostly about extending the court's power in one direction. Um, we certainly know of many cases where um, powerful executives push back and, and push the court's power away so that they can rule. And maybe they're not mirror images of each other. You mentioned people power being uh, the, the, the popular support for the court being the critical ingredient in Taiwan's case. And so I guess my first question um, for thinking about why some courts are able to move in the direction that Taiwan did, um, is people power uh, sufficient? How exactly does it work so that Taiwan could do this? Yes, they had popular support and yes, they did it. But what's the causal mechanism that, that makes that happen? The one that occurs to me is that there's in the background the possibility of a revolution, that the National Assembly has been ruling illegitimately. Um, there, were, there were popular demonstrations in the 50s that were ruthlessly suppressed, and many Taiwanese were killed. Um, and there was this unrest simmering ever since uh, because of the undemocratic features that you talked about. Were things getting to the point where the national legislature could see that if they didn't follow court instructions, the alternative was demonstrations in the streets that might bring down the government. I can't remember the chronology of how Taiwan's story unfolds relative to Korea, but are they already, are they looking to Korea as an, uh, a, another scenario that could happen to them? Student demonstrations bringing down the government. So, so that's a first question. How does people power actually do it? I don't quite believe that the uh, national legislatures read the popular, the polls in the newspapers that these Judges are quite popular. We better do what they say. Um, so I want to hear a little bit more about that. And if you have time after addressing that question, um, basically the question is, is it a mirror image um, when courts move in the other direction? So in countries like Poland and Hungary, where it seems like the courts have lost power to, to executives that are aggrandizing their power. Uh, is that because the courts were unpopular and they, the uh, executives took advantage of that? Uh, so that's, those are my two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Those are, those are really terrific questions. They're deep questions. And I'm going to give like a normative theory answer first and then a very <clears throat> hardcore, avertureized social science, hardcore, empirical, blah, 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 political science answer. So hydrize from that one. In if you were dealing with an actual democratic society, then by definition, if you have the people on your side, you should win. It's just a question of through what institutional channels will the public get its way? And how long will it take, right? Somebody's gonna offer, somebody's gonna have agenda setting power. Here's where it starts to get political science. Someone's gonna have agenda setting powers and offer the public its ideal world. And once a body does so, could be a court in this case, it will be very difficult to move off of that point because if you try to move off of that point, some other political actor, namely the public, is going to reject the efforts to do so. You could get thrown out of office at the next election. If you try to undo what the constitutional court does, I think in the specific case of Taiwan, that would have happened, right? Now, you're asking what would have happened if the National Assembly simply refused to comply with the Taiwanese constitutional court's decision. You know, would the Taiwanese constitutional court have sent in its marshals to remove them? I think the enforcement question 
is difficult, but it's no more difficult than, say, the enforcement question the U.S. Supreme Court faces when it orders Nixon to hand over the Watergate tapes, right? What's the U.S. Supreme Court going to do? Send in the U.S. Marshals across the White House lawn and break the windows and get past the Secret Service and grab the tapes? No, right? There has to be this expectation that everyone's going to comply with the decision. And now things start to get tricky, again, in social science, but I think one of the things that courts and constitutions have going for them, even when they lack enforcement power, which they do, is they are focal points for coordination. When a court does something, when a constitution says something, we're expect our expectations about what will happen change. And when the Taiwanese constitutional court says, you guys have to leave, right? The expectation is that's what's going to happen. And if they try not to leave, people will stop complying with them. It's a losing game. So I do think courts and constitutions have this power to change people's expectations. The Taiwanese Constitutional Court had that, particularly after it got away with Interpretation 261. It's like, if you had any questions about whether we can get our way, you know that decision where we told the government to rewrite the Constitution and they did? Yeah, try and take us on now, right? That's a very powerful signal to the entire Taiwanese society that what the court says, others will comply with. And once you accept that, whether you're the old thieves in the National Assembly or Richard Nixon grinding your teeth at the bottom of the Supreme Court, you might not like it, but you're looking down the game tree and thinking, I think I'm going to lose this one. I think that's what happens. I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer. Yes, Professor Stephen. David, it's a wonderful talk. And I just have a, a question really reflecting my ignorance of Taiwanese history. Uh, I'm just wondering how much of this story is uh, could be explained as the court having a sense that even though they weren't the creature of the new president, that the new president had their back. Um, so we see this in other countries where uh, constitutional courts either are installed to be tame or decide to be tame to help the president out with the legislature. And, and I'm just wondering whether any part of that story is applicable. I think that uh, there are definitely some dynamics like that. I think there are parts of the KMT that, like uh, Li Denghui, right, was a modernizer, reformer, local Taiwanese born. He didn't like these old thieves. He kind of viewed them as an embarrassment. I think a lot of people in the KMT, particularly Taiwanese locals who were KMT, were embarrassed by these guys and wanted to get rid of them, but they couldn't openly go to war with them. And so the Taiwanese Constitutional Court declaring open season on them is kind of helpful for them. I think that is a real element of it. Um, I think the same thing is true of Interpretation 499, uh, where you know the the they don't want to openly declare war on their fellow party members, but some of them are glad that the Constitutional Court is helping this along. Um, and so, you know, one reason this the judicial review, your, your, this is a key theme of judicial review literature, which Professor Stephen is highlighting. Courts don't always become powerful over the objection of elected officials. Sometimes elected officials are happy to see the courts take things over, right? Like, this is a hot potato, or this is an issue that's going to divide our party. Like, yeah, I'm happy for the court to take the heat for this one. Thank you very much. Like, oh, I'm so unhappy with the court did. I'm delighted with what the court did. I mean, that happens. Um, Mark Raber, the non-majoritarian dilemma, that's a landmark work in the literature, and he kind of talks about that. Like, even in this country, if it comes to an issue like slavery or abortion, those are part issues that split the parties. And you might be very happy for the US Supreme Court to take the heat on that one. If you're the Democratic Party circa the 1970s, right? You don't have to deal with abortion. Oh, what a pity. Actually, that's really great. Right? Same for the Republicans. So I think there's an element of that for sure. It's, you know, I mean, I don't want to suggest for the sake of time and simplicity, I'm going for the univariate explanation like it's all about public support. But the political dynamics, you know, one of the nice things about these interinstitutional struggles when courts decide them is. Uh, you know, courts fret about whether there'll be compliance with their judgments, but when courts decide disputes among government institutions, it's actually not the worst case scenario for judicial power. Because on the one hand, yes, you are ruling against a powerful government actor, but on the other hand, you have a powerful government actor behind you on your side. And so when the constitutional court picks winners and losers in these institutional power struggles, obviously the losers are unhappy, but the winners have got your back. And that's a recurring dynamic, and I think the Taiwanese case does illustrate that. So thanks for the chance to highlight that. Um, I really enjoyed the talk, but I, 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 I was kind of thinking, this is all um, a version of Taiwanese culture viewed through uh, 
What I'm thinking is that my Taiwanese friends who are 60, early 70s, told me that for their parents who are were in Taiwan before 1948 or the golden age was Japan, Japanese culture. I'm wondering where is that influence on the cultural institutions? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I think it's a very interesting question. I don't see that, I mean, to get the understanding of Taiwanese attitudes to the Japanese, I have to go back to my grandmother's generation. I don't see the, the I don't see this as being a, a, a game, first and foremost, that turns on cultural beliefs and expectations. Um, I do say that these lessons are generalizable because I think that the, the strategic commonalities, the strategic situation the court finds itself in is common regardless of culture. Um, and there are reasons, for reasons I can go into, I'm a little leery of cultural explanations of judicial and political behavior, for partly for the reason Talcott Parsons questioned these explanations. Where you know, how do you explain behavior, culture? What is culture? A pattern of behavior, and then you get stuck in this loop, right? And I don't think it's necessary to resort to those potentially circular cultural arguments to explain what's going on. I think that you basically have an institution that uh, wants to see Taiwan democratize, is trying to figure out what it can do to get that, and is looking at the lay of the land. Who are we competing with? Where does the public sit? What are we gonna do? And I don't know that there's anything unique about Chinese or Japanese cultural values that would have led the court to do what it did. Stretching it, my sense of Taiwanese culture is that, uh, you know, Taiwanese people generally try to be considerate of each other, and they're kind of mindful of how other people feel. And so I don't, I think it's kind of second nature for a, these thoughtful, intelligent people on the Taiwanese Constitution Court to be like, well, how are people going to react to this? But that's not a crazy question for even people in highly individualistic cultures to ask themselves. You'd be silly as a political institution never to ask yourself, well, how are people going to react to this? There may be some cultural tailwinds there to encourage them to take that more seriously, but that's not something that only Taiwanese or Japanese people would ask themselves. Would be my answer. Yes, Professor. I want to follow up on Fred's question. It's the same kind of question, but in a different way, which is you've mentioned a few times civil versus common law. And uh, could you tell us, sort of in terms of judicial review, how they're different? Because in the Taiwanese case, is so much more different than the, the cases you said that are as often analyzed. They're all common law. So, you know, what is it about Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, and possibly? China in the future, that makes it very different in the discussion of how the court can help over and how our world is to people. That is a great and understudied question. Um, and what, it's been kind of glossed over because even if you look at the countries that people normally study in the literature, it's a mix of civil and common law jurisdictions in that Germany is a core case in this literature. Now then people also say, well, Germany's constitutional court is very common law-like in various respects. I won't get into that. I think there's definitely room for literature on whether and to what extent there are systematic differences in judicial review between civil and common law courts. I think that the differences pertain, are relevant mainly to the study of constitutional law. People don't like civil law jurisdictions because those courts produce shorter opinions. And they're just, from that perspective, not, there's not as much to mine. You put it in a case book and you get one paragraph instead of 10, right? Um, but that doesn't mean the ideas are different. It doesn't mean that the strategic considerations are different. So, so I think that civil law countries kind of get the raw end of the deal when it comes to whether their cases are taught. The Germans are an exception because their court produces verbose opinions. So maybe the key variable is actually verbosity of opinion, which correlates highly with, but not perfectly with common law versus civil law. The other way it comes in is that um, civil law jurisdictions tend to have specialized constitutional courts. In common law countries, it's usually the job of the apex court. Uh, and in civil law countries, the Chalcidian model, there's a specialized court for it. That's not true 100% of the time, like the Japanese have civil law system, but they have a single apex court. Um, but this does have implications of constitutional politics, but I think where I see them, I see them is mainly in, it creates inter-court competition in civil law jurisdictions. Like Korea is fun because the Korean Supreme Court and the Korean Constitution are like, bam, bam, let's get it on, fight, right? Um, that hasn't really happened in Taiwan, but, so there are complications 
to the constitutional and judicial politics stories in civil law countries because you have competing apex courts. But uh, in the Taiwanese scenario, the Taiwanese Supreme Court was like, I don't know where they were, but they weren't in the action on this one. Um, but that might have been very different had it been Korea or France, for example. Um, but I think there's work to be done there. That's an interesting question. Yeah. We have had a couple of questions come in on the chat from our online audience. And one of these is uh, from Kathy Huang. And, um, so she um, wonders if you can talk about contemporary issues in constitutional law affairs in Taiwan. Um, are there some hot button social issues today where the court might get ahead of popular opinion yeah. and, and have some difficulties um, that it didn't see in the earlier case yeah. you talked about? I love friendly leading questions. Um, so, so 499 is not the last time that the Taiwanese constitutional court was asked to review a constitutional amendment. Uh, there was another one that involving the introduction of proportional representation. And I, I'm not gonna fight the consensus sense of the Taiwanese legal academics here, which is that after pulling off democratization, the court's kind of like, you don't need us to, in, to do so much heavy lifting now. The rest of the institutional environment is reasonably well-developed. We don't see institutions doing anything dramatically anti-democratic. So now if it's like some, like I think it's number 721, where it's uh, what a proportional representation requires small parties to have a minimum number of minimum vote share in order to get a seat. And they're like, yeah, other countries do that too. Maybe it's not ideal, but this is within bounds. And so we're gonna be hands off. I think there is some Taiwanese legal academics are frustrated that the, the TCC is not in its glory days of I'm gonna strike this down and I'm gonna strike that down. But the answer to that could be times have changed. Fortunately for the Taiwanese court, they don't need to be doing all this clearing away of institutional underbrush and getting rid of people who were elected once 40 years ago. Um, they have on one instance, so one thing they figured out is, is as with many populations, Taiwanese people like privacy. Privacy rights are really popular. And the Taiwanese court was pretty aggressive in terms of pushing privacy as a right. Uh, they did get up to the issue of LGBTQ rights. And some people say that they went too far from the perspective of the public in that they were the I believe the first a constitutional court in Asia to uh, uh, uphold LGBTQ rights on constitutional grounds. Um, uh, and, to, uh, uh, and so there they arguably got ahead of public opinion. But even there, you know, did they get that far ahead? I don't know. And then they were aware there was pushback and maybe they pulled back a bit of response to that. I do think that that is a court that is relatively savvy about public opinion and relatively thoughtful about it. Um, and I don't think that makes them really exceptional from a global perspective. Um, I think they have taken a step back partly because they feel that they can uh, and they can afford to, and they continue to push in areas where they don't anticipate some serious problems, where they do stay clear of fights between the political parties. You, you hand them a decision that's like a blue-green conflict, KMT versus DPT, and they're like, I, what's the, oh, we forgot to dock at that case. Look what time it is, time for lunch. They're just like doing everything but running under the table and pretending they're not there and turning off the lights, right? So there's an element of that. Um, they're really avoidant of uh, inter-party disputes, anything that looks partisan, but they're willing to push on negative rights. Um, well, there's one more question and I hope some students will ask some questions after that. Um, the, the questioner asks whether the ability of the Taiwanese court to push more in a democratic direction in the way you described is, that is partly a function of the ethnic homogeneity and the smallness of Taiwan's society. On ethnic homogeneity, I will go just a few hundred nautical miles to the north and say, I don't think that can be it because Japan is at least as ethnically homogenous. South Korea is at least as ethnically homogenous going even a little further up the coast. Uh, South Korea is super feisty in terms of constitutional politics like Taiwan, and Japan is brain dead. Like there's nothing going on there in terms of Japanese judicial review. It is like, check the patient, look for a pulse. Is the court still alive? We think so, but we're not sure. Uh, and so it can't be, it can't be a, definitely can't be a unitary model of ethnic diversity or you know, heterogeneous societies gives you judicial review. It can be raw material, right? But you can get conflict in the absence of, of ethnic heterogeneity. We know that from South Korea and Taiwan. And you can also get like nothing, crickets. We know that from Japan. What was the other part of the question? Um, smallness. Smallness. Oh, point made. The argument is that small means more conflict or small means less conflict? Um, that allowed the, the court to lead 
the nation towards democracy more. It would have been a big country. Yeah, so Cyprus is 1.2 million people, and it's a miracle they haven't all killed each other. <laughs> so, uh, again, I don't think size is going to be the univariate explanation there. Right? They have tried to kill each other. Um, uh, so, um, do I think that small states Belgium, they, you know, I, that's, they don't resort to violence, but they're kind of a basket case. Um, so, small states can, uh, Kosovo, <laughs> Bosnia Herzegovina. So, you know, small state, small state does not equal less trouble. I would just put it that way, right? Could be Singapore where it's like, you drop gum, time to get go to prison, right? Uh, that level of you know, social harmony and unison, whatever it comes from. Or it could be uh, Cyprus, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo. Um, I'm gonna kill all the minority members block by block, kind of a thing. I think I saw at least one more question here. Yeah, so I'm just wondering judicial review in the context of federalism. So the cases you talked about in uh, Taiwan or Korea and our old you know, centralized national government. But in, in the case of Canada, for instance, provincial governments did practice notwithstanding powers, for, for instance, in Quebec, yeah. really just wearing, you know, there's a majoritarian uh, you know, support for banning religious wearing in public, public yeah. schools and public yeah. government, whereas the majority of Canadian, on the other hand, would support the Supreme Court decision to, yeah. you know, saying that uh, the CAQ's decision to ban those wearings are unconstitutional. How do you balance that in a federalism society? Because the majority of the province is in odds with the majority of the whole country. The majority of the provinces are in, in odds with the national government. Yeah. Yeah, since we have a, another Canadian ringer in the room. Uh, so the relationship, so I guess the question is, what's the relationship between federalism and judicial review? Yeah, Does federalism create more problems for the court to solve? Does it make the court more powerful? That kind of a thing? Yeah. Um, there is an excellent argument I teach my students, uh, Martin Shapiro, The Success of Judicial Review in Democracy, where he argues that uh, if you think about where judicial review, particularly with respect to rights, comes from. It has to come from somewhere. And chances are that when the government is created, uh, the people who create the Constitution are not sitting around going, you know what would be great is creating a court that tells us what laws we can't pass because they infringe on individual rights. What's more likely, he says, is that you have uh, a bunch of competing actors. It could be different institutions, different branches, different parties, or different states and provinces, and they need a referee for their disputes. And then, so you create a referee, whether it's the European Court of Justice for the Europeans or the Canadian Supreme Court for Canada, et cetera, et cetera, US Supreme Court for the US. And then over time, what happens is this court, like a junkyard dog, that's Shapiro's metaphor, it doesn't just patrol the federalism disputes. Over time, it creeps into patrolling individual rights disputes. And by then you're stuck with it. You can't really get rid of it, right? So there's kind of creep, judicial review creep from the federalism context where all the elites agree that you need it to the, oh, don't tell me you're enforcing gay rights now. Ah, oh, you weren't supposed to, this was about free trade. What are you doing, court? But by then you can't do anything about it. Um, but I don't know that uh, federalism is either a necessary or sufficient condition for highly conflictual uh, constitutional politics. Uh, it adds a layer of conflict potentially, um, but if the regions don't correspond to the relevant political actors, and it can be irrelevant. So in Nepal, for example, the way that the provinces were drawn, this was kind of deliberate, they were kind of drawn vertically on the map to not correspond to the uh, particular ethnic or linguistic groups. And as a result, they don't really, they're not really players. Uh, Bhutan is supposed to have, you know, something like a federal system, but there's not, it's just not really happening. It's not something that people rally around and fight over. Um, you know, generally, federalism is not so much a cause of conflict, but a symptom of the things that cause conflict. Why does a country adopt a federal system? Nepal is a bit weird, but typically it's because you have pre existing communities that are geographically defined that are fighting to preserve some domain of power for themselves. And so they come into the country with this beef and this agenda, and then they're given an institutional platform with which to pursue their beefs. So I wouldn't, I don't, there's a correlation there, but I don't think it's the introduction of federalism per se that causes the conflict. You could also have things blow up the other way around, where let's take Afghanistan, which probably should have been a federal state because you have these 
ethnic or linguistic minorities, tribes that are governed by their respective warlords. And then you have a system of government in place that does not acknowledge these entities, tries not to give them a say. And the result is like, oh, are they marching on the government of Kabul? Oh, what a pity. Gee whiz. We're not going to fight against that because we don't like this government because we don't have a say in it. We don't have any special representation. So that can happen too. So I think really the key variable isn't federalism, but the pre-existing divisions in society, which may or may not be manifested institutionally or constitutionally through the machinery of federalism. 